going to get started. Um, I do encourage you to keep enjoying your lunch if you haven't quite finished, but we do want to get started so we have a chance to hear from our illustrious panel and for you to ask lots of questions. And this is key. I will probably say this numerous times, but the expectation is you're going to ask lots of questions. So be thinking that way as our panelists are giving a brief introduction. So I'm going to start by introducing them to you. First, though, I need to say thank you for coming and um, for participating in an advanced FRDO collaborative workshop. I am Mary Jo Daniel. I'm the director of the Faculty Research Development Office, which is FRDO, and I'm a co-PI on the advanced grant. And Julia Fulgham in the back is the PI and director, and Mala Toon up here is the another co-PI and the deputy director of advance. And I'm just checking that the other co-PIs aren't in the room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an amazing amount of expertise and experience on our panel. And I'm going to start with Professor Jane Lair, who is with the Electrical Computing Engineering Department here at UNM. Prior to joining UNM, she was at Sandia National Labs and the Air Force Research Lab in the Directed Energy Directorate. Dr. Lair's research interests are in high voltage component development and applications, and she recently published a book titled Foundations of Pulsed Power Technology. Mm -hmm. Professor Lair is an IEEE Fellow and a recipient of the IEEE Shea Award, the U.S. Air Force Basic Research Award, and the IEEE Region 6 Award for Leadership. She was named an Outstanding Woman of New Mexico and has been inducted into the New Mexico Hall of Fame. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Lair. <laughs> Seated directly next to Dr. Lair is Dr. Scott Tonigan, who's a research professor in the Department of Psychology and the interim director of the Center on Alcoholism, Substance Abuse, and Addictions, or CASA. He has 30 years of continuous NIH funding in support of the research he conducts, and um, he has served on the, as the chair of the UNM main campus IRB and has been in multiple roles at NIH as a reviewer, including chairing the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism and the National Institute of Drug Abuse review panels, and has been a standing member of several other review committees. His research interests include studying behavior change in mutual help programs like AA and the measurement of treatment outcome, readiness for change, and the application of advanced statistical techniques to model behavior changes over time. Welcome, Scott. Next to him is Professor Tom Turner, who's in the biology department, and he is the curator of fishes in the Museum of Southwestern Biology and the associate dean for research in the College of Arts and Sciences. His research group asks questions about ecological and evolutionary processes in aquatic environments, mostly rivers, springs, and streams in arid lands. In other words, he likes to go fishing. <laughs> A major focus is the development of stable isotope methodology and analytical tools to uncover changes to community and ecosystem processes. Dr. Turner just completed an, an appointment as a visiting program officer in the National Science Foundation Division of Environmental Biology. So he was one of those people that you call. He was answering the phone on the other side. Welcome, Tom. And Professor Danny, Daniel excuse me, Fiesel is an associate professor in electrical and computing engineering and is associated with the Center for High Technology Materials, CHTM. Prior to joining UNM, he was a project scientist in the Solid State Lighting and Energy Center at UCSB and the first employee at Sora Inc., an LED and laser startup company. His current research interests include epitaxial growth, fabrication, and characterization of hmm, three nitride materials and devices, and then a whole bunch of other stuff. It's ECE, what can I say? <coughs> in 2013, he received a, def a DARPA, a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency Young Faculty Award with a Director's Fellowship Extension in 2015. He also received an NSF Career Award in 2015. And his research at UNM has been sponsored by NSF, DOE, DOD, DARPA, DITRA, Natu National Labs, and private industry. So between the four of them, we have most of the funding agencies covered in one way or another. Oh, so welcome to all of you. 
What we're going to do is I've asked each of them to start with just a couple minutes overview of their perspective of sort of one of the primary agencies from which they've gotten funding. And then we will open it up to questions, so have them ready to go. And we'll start with Dr. Lair. But I have to give you this. This, by the way, is being recorded, and so the microphone is for the recording. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to give you the perspective on the Department of Defense. Um, there are m three main branches, well, I guess, before the Space Force comes. Uh, hopefully, they'll have their own funding line. Uh, but it's the Air Force um, Office of Scientific Research, the Army Research Lab. There's another part called the Army Research Office that's not co-located, uh, and the Office of Naval Research. Uh, most of my funding right now comes from the Office of Naval Research, and I have three different program managers. Um, they're all very different. Um, in the DOD, uh, it tends to be the program manager determines the direction of the research so that he has a portfolio that he is responsible for defending. Uh, so, of course, it's our job to make sure they have really good material uh, to defend. Um, there tends to be a, um, a split between um, advancing technology to meet a military need, um, but also they are, I would almost use the word obsessed, with pipeline. <coughs> Uh, that is pipeline of students uh, that they can then hire. Um, one of the things that I put in almost all my proposals is almost all of my graduate students are U.S. citizens. Um, this is something that I target because I have funding from the DOD. And so um, I, I also have, I always feel funny about saying that, but the, uh, the truth of it is they need as many uh, U.S. citizen clearable engineers as they can get. And so I, I target students. I, um, I have a whole routine <laughs> that I do. So if anybody wants to be bedazzled, I'll take you to my fab lab. And um, uh, you know they almost come to graduate school after that. And the program managers are really appreciative of that. Um, but that is definitely a secondary uh, influence. The biggest, the single biggest uh, thing is, can we advance their technology? Um, one important thing that can be very difficult to get a handle on is the military lingo. Um, and I use one of the re roles that I use my program managers for, I ask them how to say things. For instance, I wanted to, I was writing a proposal, of, and I wanted, I was, it was an education proposal, um, and I wanted to target sailors that are out to sea. So I asked, how do you use this in a sentence? And they said, that's what sailors go out to sea. I said, okay. Uh, but there, there are a whole host of other words. They do have their own language. And um, the more you know about their language, the easier it is to get funding. Um, cause, and they're usually very descriptive. Right. So. Oh. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm charged with talking about NIH and uh, the uh, PO. And uh, that's not probation officer. That's, that's another life that I had. Uh, this is the project officer. And you know, within NIH, a project officer, you, ha you have three functions. And I think it's very important for prospective applicants to, to understand these three roles. One is, to bounce off initial ideas to see if a particular institute in NIH is interested in that idea. And bear in mind, there are 27 institutes within the National Institute of Health. So quite a, one of the biggest challenges for you as an applicant will be to identify the appropriate institute for your idea. Sometimes it's very obvious, but other times it can be challenging. And so one role will be to call a project officer, and they can be found on the internet, and, and to literally send them a specific games page and, and have a discussion with them on the phone about here are some prospective ideas, what do you think? And you can get some very useful feedback that way. Uh, the other role is in the review process because uh, not only can they, uh, they can attend reviews, they can't participate in the review, but they can give you feedback once you have received your summary statements guiding you in what are the most important points to attend to in the summary statements. And that's a very important function they serve. And the third is, of course, monitoring the progress of your award 
on a yearly basis. And that involves the progress reports you submit and so on and so forth. And I should say there's actually a fourth role, and this is if you're blessed enough to have a project officer who, uh, who is enthusiastic about your work, they're almost like a stage mother in the sense of they're, they're looking for opportunities for you that go beyond your actual award but embed you within the institute's mission and they can actually project your career forward and in very positive ways. And I was actually very fortunate to have such a project officer early in my career. And, and so it's somebody that you do develop a relationship with. I was hearing earlier before you got online that your project officers change project to project. We tend in, in NIH, when you have a project officer, they stay with you because you don't jump areas of research. They stay with you over years. And, and so you develop a very deep relationship with them. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> so uh, as Mary Jo said, I just spent a year at the National Science Foundation as a program officer, which is sort of the first line of contact when you submit a proposal. Um, the proposal comes in to NSF. We get it. We try to figure out if it fits our program or we try to send it off to some other program that it might fit. And uh, we've shepherded the, these proposals all the way through from the submission process to the end point uh, and the uh, final decision on the proposal. I should say that I worked in bio, uh, the bio biology directorate, and that there's uh, eight, at least eight directorates at NSF that are research oriented and they're very different in culture across each of the different directorates. So it's important to remember that if you submit to bio, there's going to be sort of a cultural thing going on in bio in other places like geo, let's say, or uh, uh, in SBE, uh, social and behavioral and economic sciences. There's a, a slightly different culture. I did have a chance to work on some cross-cutting programs. So I did work with program officers from a variety of different directorates. Uh, both on individual proposals that we wanted to try to fund that we felt like sort of reached across uh, inter uh, uh, disciplinary boundaries. And then on, a, on a, uh, a program called the Coupled Natural and Human Systems Program, which is really focused on bringing together social sciences, physical sciences, and engineering to, to address you know, sort of problem-oriented type, uh, uh, type uh, proposals. So, uh, you know, there it's a lot better to sort of discuss things because, you know, things come up and program officers, I will tell you, have a lot of power with regards to what gets funded and what doesn't. Um, the process is that we solicited uh, ad hoc reviews from the community. We would convene panels to discuss proposals and then sit and judiciously take notes about how panelists discussed the proposals, how they felt like they advanced the science and did the kinds of things that uh, we were looking for, but it's uh, not only the ideas and the advancement of science, but it's also a couple of other things that we use. Portfolio balance was a big one, so we didn't want to send all of the money to one university, but rather we wanted to kind of spread the wealth around. And we were very interested in diversity and inclusion and making sure that there was a very um, uh, well-described pathway that, that that could happen. I think UNM plays a really strong role, and UNM had a big profile in bio at NSF. It really surprised me. I, I personally couldn't be involved with it because I had a conflict of interest with everything that UNM did, but UNM really played a big role. So there's, there's already a strong, you know, UNM presence, I think, at least in bio and certainly in geo and some of the other divisions that I were and directorates that I worked with at NSF. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I had a year. You can get into the politics a little bit at NSF, but it's mainly about trying to figure out what cool proposals you can work with other people to get funded. And that's, that's how I spent my time there. Okay, so I'm charged with uh, discussing the process and program managers at the Department of Energy. And so I thought what I would do at the beginning is just sort of run through um, how the process progresses. And so at DOE, they would typically put out an FOA or a funding opportunity announcement. And that funding opportunity announcement could be in basic energy sciences, for instance. There's an early career opportunity in basic energy sciences in DOE for assistant professors. It could be an EERE, which is the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, or it could be in one of the, um, uh, the sub-agencies like ARPA-E, which is the Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy. 
And so you could respond to the funding opportunity announcement. And typically, these funding opportunity announcements will require uh, you to write a white paper. And a white paper is a, like a pre-proposal. It's a two or three page pre-proposal that you would write. And you would submit that uh, to the um, appropriate program manager that's associated with a given topic. Many of the FOAs have many topics um, within them. And so then your white paper would be reviewed typically just by the program manager that's associated with that topic. And then they would either encourage you to submit a full proposal or they would discourage you from submitting a full proposal. And so the white paper stage is really important because it acts as a filter that prevents people from spending weeks on end writing a 20-page proposal. And then the program manager has absolutely no interest in the topic that you've proposed. And so if your white paper is encouraged, uh, that's definitely a good sign. It doesn't guarantee that you will be funded. And then after, if you have a white paper encouraged, you would write a full proposal. And then at that stage with DOE, you typically will receive five or six uh, reviews, um, similar to the NSF uh, scenario. So I sort of see DOE as falling somewhere in between DOD and NSF. So there will be five or six reviews that you get. And something that's interesting about DOE is oftentimes you are allowed to respond formally or required to respond formally to the reviews. So you sort of get an opportunity to rebut points that the reviewers make or add clarifications to your proposal. And so this sort of gives you one more opportunity to circle back and sort of tie up any loose ends that the reviewers saw. And then those reviewers would convene in a panel, again, similar to NSF. Uh, the panel would make a funding decision uh, recommendation to the program manager. And then at the end of the day, it would ultimately be the program manager's decision as to which proposals are funded and which proposals are rejected. But my impression with DOE is that the reviews are extremely important. So you will definitely get five or six reviews, typically, with your DOE proposals. And then, of course, once a decision is made, um, the program manager would notify you uh, one way or another. And so that's sort of how the process progresses with the Department of Energy. Okay. So a couple of clarifying questions while you're coming up with your questions, if you haven't already. Um, in terms of DOD, how does the review work in terms of what's the program manager, program officer's role in terms of reviewing the proposals? So uh, I also recommend always starting with a white paper. Um, and in fact, I spend more time on a white paper than I do on the proposal. And part of that is that's what gets the attention, that's what generates the excitement. Um, so the program officer in DOD usually gets uh, the white paper, uh, often makes suggestions, which you should take. Uh, and um, when the full proposal goes in, they, they do get reviewed um, and they coordinate it. I, um, I'm not sure, okay, here's the problem, I've never lost a proposal that I put to DOD, so. You mean they've all gotten funded? They've all gotten funded. I think I just jinxed myself, right? <laughs> um, but part of it is uh, the white paper. Um, and I've had people come back and say, we're just not interested in the whole topic. Um, uh, and often I'll start actually with a conversation first. So what's your biggest problem? And that's what I like to start, you know, go big, right? <laughs> um, and then they do go off for review. Usually, uh, since I have so much ONR funding, it's usually Naval Research Lab or Naval Surface Warfare Center, um, people that are reviewing it. And I've had them, um, they don't usually send them back to me, the reviews, but one of them has, and I was really surprised. The comment was, she's got a lot of current and pending. Is she going to have enough time to work on this? And I was like, oh gosh, I never thought, I, that was the last thing I thought would be a problem. Um, so I did explain to the program officer, I, I do have a lot of students, I have a postdoc. Uh, it'll be fine, so. Okay. Um, sorry. Any of you have questions ready to go? <laughs> Let's start up here, and I'll try running, but I don't know if this will work.
Thank you. I had a question for. You have to um, speak really loudly because that's not in microphone in the room. That's just for the, the okay. recording. Uh, I had a question for Dan for the uh, basic energy sciences. Um, what is? Uh, can you tell us a little bit more uh, about the process of uh, rebutting to reviews? Um, does the program officer invite you to rebut? Because I I had an experience where I got the reviews I didn't know. Um, that I could rebut the reviews, and I just didn't do anything. So, um, is this like uh, a formal invitation that uh, please respond to the reviewer comments, or is it an assumed knowledge that you should know to do this? Yeah. Hold on. Get my steps in. Okay, so this is a very important question. Um, I do not advocate rebutting the reviews or even questioning the reviews unless it is formally required. Okay. okay, so some of the programs within DOE formally require you to rebut and respond to the reviewers. Others do not. Basic Energy Sciences, to my knowledge, has not done that. RPE does it and EERE does it as well. So I would be very careful about unsolicited responses to the reviewers, I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, and I wanted to say one other thing regarding um, reviews and white papers. So, with respect to reviews from DoD, while I know that they have reviewers, I have never received reviews from DoD, and so you're sort of in the dark about what happens with your proposal a lot of the time. With DOE and NSF, you actually receive the reviews, and then you can use those reviews constructively to improve your proposal if it's not funded, for example. But with DOD, you receive a decision, and, and Jane, please jump in if, if you have other scenarios here, but every DOD proposal I've submitted, I never receive any reviews from it. And then, Scott, you want to talk about NIH reviews, just so oh, we're on this? Sure. I th I I'm not sure where to attach it, uh, attack it because we could talk for about reviews for an hour and a half. Uh, NIH reviews do produce summary statements. They're affectionately called pink sheets because back in the day they were actually pink and that term has just stuck. And uh, in an NIH review you have three assigned reviewers out of a committee of somewhere between 12 and 15 people. Uh, and they will write a formal review which they present to the larger group. And after uh, all the applications have been reviewed in a cycle, there are three cycles at NIH, uh, October, February, and June. Those are the submission dates. There are exceptions for RFAs, but in general, those are the dates. Um, you would then receive electronically those summary statements al along with your impact score if indeed your grant was reviewed. 50% are triaged uh, before the review session. They are the lower 50%. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to be a salmon and get up the river a little bit and you, miss, you, know, you avoid that first cut, uh, you'll get a, a formal summary statement. And typically, once you get that statement, which is about 20 days after the review, you would then call your project officer and uh, go through that summary statement and, and get their feedback because sometimes your summary statements might be somewhere between four and 12 pages long. There's a lot of concerns or weaknesses or strengths. You don't know what to attend to in your revision, and your project officer is very instrumental in helping you identify those. Of course, they won't identify who your reviewers are, but they will carefully lean you towards particular points. Okay. You're just gonna, yeah. you're gonna talk. Okay. I'm, not I'm, I'm a projector, it's okay. <laughs> um, so, I'm just gonna stand up because I can see you all over the, but, um, you know, Dr. Blair's comments, it struck me that the initial contact with the program or project officer is something that's really important. And I'm wondering if you could talk, the rest of you, maybe you could talk a little bit about making that initial contact and putting that initial document before them or what that should look like, how developed it should be, things like that. Why don't we start with Tom? Yeah, so um, NSF's a little different than the other, these other folks that have talked about. I mean, generally a white paper is not required. You respond to an RFP or a solicitation. One of the key things is to read everything in the solicitation and make sure you respond to everything in the, in the solicitation. 
But it's generally not done that a white paper goes forward first. Sometimes some programs at NSF require a letter of intent that's reviewed by program officers and then there's a triage type process where there's some proportion of those are invited for a full proposal. Um, NSF used to, in, in bio, also used to have a pre-proposal process where a short proposal that really hit on the big picture uh, issues would be submitted and then considered by a panel, a, a, a review panel, and they either put forward or, or um, declined at that stage. Um, but it's not usually that you make a very, uh, you know, a, a formal request to a program officer directly. Generally, you'll just submit a proposal in response to a, to a solicitation. We'd like you to respond to these particular issues. And uh, that came up a couple of times in proposals that we were considering. And um, so when you get that, that usually means that there's probably some, con your proposal's still in the game, right? That there might be some still, uh, or if you just get a, a straight out decline, there really is no process that you can use to respond to the reviews directly in that cycle. But in the next cycle, you might respond to the reviewers in your proposal if you submit again to that program. Before you pass it on, just a quick follow up. While there isn't a formal white paper for NSF, is there any value in submitting something informally to a program officer before um, submitting a Well, the, you know, there's a few mechanisms at NSF, and some of which uh, require sort of the full proposal review process that includes, in pan, you know, panel and all that, and others that are more at the discretion of a program officer. So small grants, like we had this program in bio called RAPID, it's uh, these, you know, uh, environmental changes like a big fire or something that would, you know, it was something that you needed to get on the ground and get some data on right away. Those would be totally at the discretion of a program officer. So you could, you could um, contact the program officer that you thought might be a good one that would be interested in what you're doing in that program. And then there would be sort of a back and forth in that regard, and then they would ask you to prepare, you know, a, a white, a small white paper perhaps that describes a proposal and uh, it, it uh, is a slightly different process because it's more internal consideration only. And these would be small things, you know, on the order of a couple hundred thousand dollars, not, not full proposals. Thanks. Yeah, because I think, Ranger, I, if, like you probably, I have heard, and it might, there might be some differing norms in different uh, directorates, perhaps, that, uh, about, you know, whether it's appropriate to like, send a one or two pager to see, you know, is this something that is a good fit? Well, I'll give you an example. I had somebody submit something to me on a career proposal to, uh, to the division I was working in that was environmental biology, and it wasn't quite appropriate, but I shipped it over to a program officer in another division that it was more appropriate for, and, that, and then they could have a little bit of a back and forth. So it's not that you never contact a program officer with an idea, but you know, putting together a you know, multi-page white paper, generally you start with the idea and it's more of an informal conversation and it can move to something more formal. Thank you. Other questions? I just sorry, I was wondering if it's the same at NIH or what's oh, okay. the NIH also? No. Very similar. I mean, there, there's nuances, and I think one point that should be made and stress is project, project officers are not a monolith entity. There's tremendous variation in their styles, their communication patterns. I've had POs that, frankly, wouldn't talk to you in advance of a submission of an application without you sending specific aims to them because, frankly, they have a lot of calls, and they feel that if you can't formalize your ideas in advance, why should they help you do that over the phone? Uh, and then there are others who are more, more than willing to do that. Um, so there's quite a bit of variation, but I would say it's very similar. I think, at least with NIH, um, it's important to realize, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, but the role of the project officer is to generate applications and to enlarge their portfolio. So it's a bit like buying a car. When you go out to the car dealership, every car is wonderful from that salesman's viewpoint. So every proposal has merit when they first talk to you. So you have to kind of gauge what is the real level of enthusiasm there. And it takes a little bit of time, and, and mentoring is important in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, two, actually. Uh, first, does uh, UNM have a Washington office that keeps these relationships 
form on behalf of all researchers? Or? Not that I'm aware of. They're looking at me. The answer is yeah. no. <laughs> okay. We have a lobbyist. Yeah. That, uh, that, right. But they're not um, advocating for you with program offices. Right. Right. But they're keeping track of funding priorities. Okay. And then uh, with regard to a remark that you made, Jane, about uh, having a whole lot of grants, which is a problem we'd all love to have. But uh, back when I had some AFOSR grants, um, they wanted to see the budget of every project I was working on and what percent of my time was allocated to it to make sure that it did not yes. go over 100%. It wasn't just a matter of, of reassuring them with some nice words. They, they checked. Yeah. Is that changed or are they still? Um, uh, that was with one, oops, sorry. Oh. Uh, that was that one time. Um, the uh, my other program officers have not inquired what else I do when I'm not oh, working oh, for them. So, uh, and it goes back to what you said. The, all the program offices are very different. And one of the things that I do do is track what's important to each program officer because they all have different measures of success. Um, the other thing that I haven't heard yet is I've had been very successful visiting Washington D.C. Um, and in fact, um, last year I dropped by one program officer. I didn't have anything active at the time to say hi and walked away with the grant. So. <laughs> well, and actually it was even funnier than that. He was interested in electrical breakdown of seawater. And I told him, you are literally not going to believe this. I am one of two people who have actually done that. <laughs> And that's what I wound up doing a feasibility study for him. So, just lucky. Just lucky. Yep. I think more than that. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on the organizational structure of the white paper you're talking about and if that changes across agencies, kind of what a solid white paper looks like. What can I? Um, so recently I, um, I was mentoring a young faculty member and I asked her to send me a white paper that I would send around to see where, who would bite. Um, and uh, she wound up sending me something that was um, way too light. It was more about what her, cap what her interests were. Um, and when I write white papers, I am very specific. I write an actual idea to address something. Um, and it's as much to start the conversation as, uh, as anything else. Um, the, the structure of the white paper can vary. Um, at, at the first contact, it can be very informal. Um, in fact, sometimes it's just an email. Oh, I was, I'm a little interested in this. Are you interested? Um, um, but also, like, ONR has an actual format that they want their white, white paper. But the other thing is the white paper should never be over five pages. Um, so it's a diff it can be difficult to write because you're trying to get a lot of information and a lot of excitement in five pages. Um, just FYI, that's how Sandia writes their proposals too. So a lot of times the Sandia proposal is limited to two pages. Danny, do you want to add anything about DOE perspective on white papers? Um, yeah, I'll just kind of add some uh, some comments in general. So. Um, in terms of initial contacts with uh, program officers, I've certainly just cold called or emailed people and sometimes I receive a response and other times I don't receive a response. But there are some other tangible ways that you can sort of get involved and make your name known to the program manager. So uh, one thing to do is to try to volunteer as a reviewer. So if you're going for NSF, be a reviewer. Go sit on a panel, right? You'll meet the program officer review for the program that uh, you want to submit to, right? So that's a, that's a tangible thing that you can go and do. Sometimes in DOE, they have uh, webinars. So uh, uh, an FOA will come out and there'll be a webinar that's associated with the F FOA and you can ask questions during the webinar, uh, either directly of the program manager or of some representative of the program that the program manager has designated. So that's another good way to sort of get your questions put across in, in an environment that, um, isn't quite as encouraging as DOD. With DOD, I think it's really important to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with your program manager. It's less so at DOE and probably even less so at NSF. 
And so it sort of progresses like that. And so I would encourage you to sort of take some of these other steps to try, you know, aside from just emailing, uh, to try to get uh, contact with your program manager. Another common thing that I see in both DOD and in DARPA is the creation of what's called a quad chart. Right? And your quad chart will summarize your project in one PowerPoint slide. And so you'll have four different sections to it. Basically, one section will describe what, what the need is, right? what the technological or scientific need is. Then you'll describe what you're proposing. You'll describe exactly how you're going to perform the research. And then in the fourth one, you might describe what your resources are, the capabilities of your team. And so a quad chart can very quickly convey to the program manager exactly what your idea is, how you're going to implement it, why it's important, and what resources you have to implement that. What you've heard is correct. Uh, um, my understanding, and there, there very well might be an exception, is that uh, you have to be regarded as an independent investigator, which means that you've acquired an R01. Uh, there are many different mechanisms, R03, R21, et cetera, et cetera, and then the K Awards, the Young Investigator Awards. But you must have acquired an R01 to be a, a standing committee member. Under rare situations, they may invite you to be an ad hoc reviewer if they have an extremely specialized application that you have a unique skill to review, uh, but that's not very common. So how do you learn more? <laughs> well, I mean, this is a long conversation, but I think for the person who's aspiring to be an NIH investigator, <clears throat> one of the most important things is to find the right mentor. Yeah. Find someone who has an R01, who is giving with their time and their expertise. They include you as a co-investigator in a subsequent application. You begin to acquire the skills. You submit an R21 smaller scale study. You then step up to an R01, get that reviewed, and then you start getting the, the invitations for reviewing. But I think mentoring is, is the key. And mentoring by funded investigators. investigators. Right. Okay. So I'm going to address both your qu your comment your questions first because you know service at NSF is really highly regarded in uh, let's say you know so the major factor is the intellectual merit of the proposal and so NSF has two criteria that they generally use it's the intellectual merit and the broader impacts right of a of a particular proposal idea so the way people organize you know so it's not quite as clean as the quad chart but it's sort of laid out in that in that way. But let's imagine we've got two proposals that the intellectual merit is about the same. When that decision comes down, people do consider service to NSF as one of the things that, that will be talked about, right? Now, I'm not saying, I mean, I, and there's also considerable appreciation for, uh, for you know, life, life uh, you know, things, like you, if you have kids and you have all these things. There are, there are virtual panels that you can, that you can participate in. But um, I think service is, is a thing. I mean, but it's your record of service over your entire career. So 
you can, as a program officer, you can get in and look at people's <coughs> reviews and you can look at when they've served. And it's not just what happened over the last couple of years. It's more like, has this person been an active participant in the, in the review process and as part of the community? So, and it depends again on the program officer, I think. Um, you know, like uh, Scott said, there's a lot of variation among people. And, um, and that's one of the things that surprised me about NSF is that it's not really this monolith of, you know, regulation. Rather, most of the things that happen up there are sort of by suggestion and that you really, um, you have a lot of individuals with different ideas about how things work. And it's really about sort of making that work among those people. So that, and when you write your proposals, I think you've got to think of the community as well, the human dimension of what's going on. So um, in terms of the quad chart, I think it's really great to have that information summarized. So you could be thinking about how to really tightly present your intellectual uh, merit parts and maybe use that as a guide um, to really tightly and concisely sort of lay out exactly what the objectives of the proposal are. Jane, I think, wanted to have something. I have two comments. Mala, for your situation, if, if I were invited to a panel and I couldn't because I had three kids and a dog, apparently, a big dog, uh, <laughs> two, two big dogs, I would respond and say, I, you know, I just can't do it right now. My kids are in soccer and blah, blah, blah. And then I would say, but if there's something I can do remotely, please think of me first. And at least that way, it, I it think it sends the right message that you just can't right now. Uh, and that's a, that's a very big issue with women. I mean, and because we all know that even with the most helpful husbands, it's just not the same. <laughs> well, you're already kind of booked on, on trips, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell this funny story. I went to Japan for three weeks with AFOSR, and it was a fun trip. It was fun. But my husband was at home with my six-year-old. And when I came home, I look at my six-year-old and he's like, fill me. And I was like, honey, when was the last time you gave him a bath? And my husband says, oops. <laughs> so yeah, it, that's actually a true story. And he really did say, oops. <laughs> uh, the, my other comment was, we should probably take a, um, uh, put a quad chart template on your FRDO website, we certainly could do that. yeah, um, because really a quad chart it is fine. It's easy to make the quad chart, but you have to know which quadrants to put everything in, and you get used. They're really useful. Yeah, and I would say the quad chart, you know, as was suggested, it, it is. If you haven't seen one, it is a way to focus on key aspects. Any kind of organizing structure that makes you really hone in on what are your key points. And how does one thing lead to another? It may not end up in the proposal itself, but that's, you know, if you were at the last one, we talked for a minute about logic models. That's what they do, too. Right. It makes you just get real explicit about how all the pieces go together. Any other, other questions out there? Well, since I have the mic, I'm going to I'm going to answer. Um, you can directly contact a program officer in the program that you're interested in and say, "Look, I'm I'd love to do some reviewing or whatever." And we are so we were so desperate to find reviewers and panelists that um, you know we uh, we were so grateful for that information. And you know, one of the things about I was a rotator there, so I knew a lot of folks from UNM. So I suggested a lot of you guys as people to come in and review. Um, and, uh, and that's another good thing about NSF is you get this constant influx of kind of new people that have a different network than the old, you know, the sort of the old guard there. And, uh, but I would be proactive. I just send an email and say, I'm available. I'd like to do some reviewing or serve on a panel. And I, that would be very welcome. Even for, even for DOD, is that appropriate? For DOD or DOE, is there a 
Well, I'll, I'll comment on DOE. I think uh, just to echo um, what Tom said, that uh, you could directly contact your program manager or a program manager of the program that you're interested in. The other thing that DOE has is they often have um, these research and development workshops that are associated with the different programs, and some of those are public. And so I would encourage you to just attend those workshops when you see them come up. For instance, the Solid State Lighting Program has an R&D workshop every year, and you can attend that workshop. They have a poster session, typically, and you can interact with the program manager for that particular program and other um, contributors to the program. The other thing that DOE has is they often outsource um, some of the program management to these consulting firms. And the people in the consulting firms are supposed to be experts in that field as well. And so DOE has um, a, a program manager. And then beneath that program manager, there would be several other people that know and help drive the technical decisions that are made in terms of the program direction. And so it's important to get in contact with those people as well. And they be, may be easier to get in touch with via email uh, than the program manager themselves would be. And so, for instance, in the solid state lighting program, there are, I think, three or four different people that are beneath the program manager uh, that are very easy to get in touch with typically via email. And so if you can figure out who those people are um, through one of these workshops, for instance, uh, it can be a path to sort of get in. And then you can volunteer yourself as a reviewer through that uh, mechanism. Other questions? So it can be a variety of ways. I mean, I some were friends of friends, you know, that and just grew. Um, I've used the um, the DoD labs quite productively. Um, so, for instance, I'll have a student that's going to Nerval Sur Surface Warfare Center in Dahlgren. And then the guy at Dahlgren called ONR and said, oh, she's doing some really interesting things. One program officer who was at, again, Dahlgren, I sent him a list of things I, I was interested in. And he chose two. And then I worked with the ONR program officer in the Navy. Um, that, and now uh, that program officer and I are very friendly. Um, on, an, on a different uh, occasion, they were, they were uh, ONR, the controls group, does something. They do workshops twice a year. And Sandia was on the hook to host the workshop. Um, well, it turns out they said, oh, well, this would be great. We'll have it at Sandia. Um, we'll just exclude all the foreign nationals. And the ONR guy said, no, you can't do that. So they came to me and said, could I help? And I was like, sure. Um, so we hosted it in the School of Engineering. We have a big auditorium. I went to Costco. I literally went with two of my undergrad students. We all shopped. We shopped for the workshop. We, uh, we put on this really nice. So it turned out that I had put on the best workshop the controls group had ever seen using my awesome soccer mom skills, <laughs> literally. Um, so after that, we kept in touch. And now, whenever I go to Washington, I call them. And you know, the first time is really nerve wracking. You know, you're going, can I come and see you? <laughs> dot, dot, dot. And you go there, and they're used to it, actually. So he had a little presentation of, these are my naval needs. Uh, you know, I should tell you, I put on this control workshop. I don't do controls. And then I, start, then I started to get interested in what he was doing. And then it turns out he's also interested in insulation, and that's what I do do. So there's, I, I, it's a little bit of follow your nose and how do you make friends anyway. But actually just cold called him because, look, they need not only to advance their program, they really want to have a diverse portfolio. Um, because they have to defend it all the time. And of course, they move up by the more money they control and move. Um, and the other part is really you need to find out what makes them successful. Of 
uh, I have one program officer, it's things like reports or papers, but the other one wants to move technology into the Navy. So uh, I did a project for him. My part was successful. The Navy base in Florida, Panama City, um, couldn't get it, couldn't move it forward to actually do the test. So he dropped it and I said, well, it was successful. He says, not to me. If it's not in the Navy, then it's not successful to me. So now I know. And I said, well, next time I'll make sure I have it all tested. I'll make sure it works if it has to transition someplace else. But like for that program manager then, I, I write in a transition plan, who I'm gonna go work with to push it into the Navy. Go ahead. So um, what I do is I actually use basic science to solve a problem. So I, I, that's, what I, that's what I've done my whole career. So for me, I, you know, um, I will start out with this is your problem that I understand. And now I'm going to use some really cool physics to... I think I didn't want my question mm -hmm. They're actually uh, pretty different. Um, so the Navy is very, very applied right now. Um, in fact, when I gave up at the program review, one of my Navy uh, program officers was sort of like, well, I need to fund this kind of research because it was so basic. Uh, he was apologizing a little bit for it. Um, but on the other hand, AFOSR, they tend to be much more 20 years out you know, they're looking for the next Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and the, the Army's a mixed bag. Thank you. So following up, I guess I didn't take this. Um, following up on one of the comments that, you know, the initial contact can be a little bit uncomfortable or disconcerting. One of the things we are offering next Tuesday, we have open hours which is drop-in time for anybody who wants to follow up on anything they heard today with one of the faculty research support officers that works with me, including, you know, how do we dig around through the website to find out who we're really contacting and if we're in the right program, but then also, you know, practicing that call. So, okay, you're going to call program officer X. What are you really going to say? And just having the opportunity, obviously we're not experts in your field, but we, just having someone to try it out on can help so that you're not stumbling as much or that you just feel a little bit more confident. And, you know, what materials would you want to have in advance? Or you can talk about anything else you want to related to developing um, research proposals. So that'll be next Tuesday. And, oops, I can't do this. I, no, I can't. There's this sign-up sheet, and it's Tuesday afternoon from 2 to 4. Thank you. And um, there will be up to four program officers, uh, program officers, oh, <laughs> FRSOs, and um, you can sign up for a time if you want to be sure one of them will be available, or you can simply drop in, and then you take your chances about whether somebody's available. So I'm going to just put this down, and we can pass it around. And then we tend to like to end these workshops formally a little bit early so that there's time for you to ask one-on-one -on -one questions, either of the panelists or of any of the FRSOs who are in the room, who I will introduce at this moment. So from Arts and Sciences, we have Vince Saracino and Jennifer Kavka. From Engineering, we have Isela Roder. I'm short. I'll stand up. <laughs> And then from my office right now, we have Stephanie Tafigi and myself. And we do have 
um, folks in architecture and planning and um, education and fine arts. And then a couple more people in my office. So there's plenty of people around to talk to you about any of the questions that you might have. You sure can. Very quickly. The, I'm sure nobody in this room would do this, but there are three things that I would encourage you never to do with a PO. Okay. <laughs> One is to be combative in the sense of you obviously have a pet idea, you're very invested in it, they're lukewarm, you become combative. That's a terrible mistake to make. Second, to be condescending or feeling that you're dealing with a staff member who cannot understand what you're trying to propose. At NIH, most project officers are PhDs and MDs. They are deep in their own field of research, uh, and they take great offense at being treated as administrative staff. And the third thing, which is very obvious, is they are government employees. You might mean very well by sending them a can of brownies after that conversation, or sending them a card, or when you see them at a conference, buying them a meal, or all the possibilities. They cannot accept any gifts from potential applicants. It is a mistake to offer that. Even when I meet with them at a conference, I say, would you like to have some coffee? It's made very clear from the beginning, thank you, I'll buy my own. So you have to be very careful not to do any of those three things. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. I will also mention, because I neglected to, that Scott um, has very graciously, for the, over the past year, served as an extra resource to my office for those folks who are working on NIH applications specifically. And he's worked with several faculty to mentor them through that process of getting a, a proposal into NIH. And um, so we're very appreciative. We just got one funded. Well, and, it, it's in the fundable range. Yeah. In the fundable range. And we've learned a lot from Scott, too, in terms of, you know, what do they look for in those um, bio sketches and, you know, how important is that personal statement beyond just the, the technical expertise. So any last questions for, that you want to ask the panel as a whole? Yes, sir. I'm asking you again as a newcomer to UNM. Uh, what's the panel's feeling about the uh, level of uh, collegiality in this in, in your college, in your department? Do people feel like uh, every man for himself, or do you, uh, is there a lot of uh, collaboration between faculty? Do you ever, do you only tote your own proposals to Washington, or do you walk down the hall first and say, you know, hey, uh, Professor Sonso, do you have any ideas on taking a trip to Washington? Uh, are you open to uh, writing proposals jointly with someone in another college at UNM, or is it only within your own? That, that kind of thing. What's your feeling about it? You're the. You're the. I'll take, <laughs> I'll take that question. You're the ADR. Yeah. So I. So Fred, I get to, a chance to see all the research that happens in the College of Arts and Sciences, which is um, a really broad, uh, you know, research mission. And um, one of the things, and I'll just. You know, I ha I'm also a researcher, and uh, I started at UNM 20 years ago. And one of the things that really I, made a difference for me, and this is the reason I'm here, is because when I first interviewed here, I got involved with a group of people that were doing water science and water policy broadly. I mean, so I came to biology, but I interacted with people from engineering and law and all over the place, right? And, um, and for me, that made all the difference in the world. And that tradition and that sort of spirit, esprit de corps, seems to you know, be there. Uh, and that's the thing, you know, often other universities don't operate that way. You know, I mean, you may have been in other, other situations where there's not a really strong collegial environment, but my experience is that we have a very collegial group of people here that really think broadly about what's going on. Please join me in thanking our panel. Oh. We do still have some refreshments in the back that you can help yourself to. Take the opportunity to talk to panelists or to any of the FRSOs. If you want to sign up for a specific time next Tuesday, hit find the orange back paper. Um, otherwise, hopefully, we'll see you soon. And our next workshop next month is specifically on working with 
the UNM Foundation and other foundations. Mm. We talked all about federal agencies, but <coughs> working with foundations for funding is a whole other beast. And so we'll be doing that in November. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks.